Winter is coming. I know it. Tristan Eamon here with Mindful Living Realty, a realtor right here in Rapid City, South Dakota. Welcome back to my YouTube channel where I talk everything about moving to Rapid City and the wonderful things about Rapid City and the Black Hills. In this video, we're gonna talk about preparing for winter. Are you ready? So it's that time of year again. Leaves are starting to fall off the trees. Temperature are getting colder. So now it's time to talk about the things around the yard you need to do to make sure you're protected from the cold. Now, first of all, it's November 3rd and it's 70 degrees today. I don't have a coat on. It's, it's a weird year right now. You don't usually expect a November 3rd to be outside without a coat on. And look, there's still leaves on the trees. Usually all the leaves are gone. So it's pretty typical South Dakota weather. We've already had two October snowstorms. So now we're on what, third fall, something like that. Changing temperatures, changing weather, always keeps you on your toes here in South Dakota. So as you make the transition from August into September, you wanna make sure that you keep your eye on the weather. Sometimes we get some really early frost in September. When it looks like it's gonna get below freezing, or at night you wanna make sure that you take care of your flowers outside, cover them up with a bucket or something. And also if you've got a garden, putting blankets on top of that will help protect your produce from that early freeze. The other thing you wanna do is make sure you remove your hoses from the outside spigots. Now the spigot itself isn't gonna freeze on you, but when you have the hose connected to the spigot and there's water still in the hose, once it gets really cold, that, that water expands and then it can break into that spigot. So make sure you remove your hose so that it's not causing issues later on down the line. The other thing you wanna do is make sure that you hire somebody to blow out your sprinklers. If you've got a water sprinkler system in your yard, make sure you get that blown out because obviously water freezing in pipes makes them explode and those are really hard to take care of, really hard to fix if, if they explode in the yard. Now, if it's just getting down to 30 degrees for a day or two and then it pops up to 40s, 50s, you're probably not gonna be in too bad of a shape. But if it's getting down to the 20s for weeks and weeks on end, that's when you're gonna wanna make sure that those sprinklers have already been blown out. You know, the next thing you're gonna to wanna to do is make sure that you clean out your gutters. As the leaves fall and the little branches fall and collect in the gutters, you wanna make sure that you get all that cleaned out. So when the snow comes and then uh, melts as it will, there's plenty of room for the water to do its thing down the gutter and out the downspout. So let's talk a little bit about your lawn. So in South Dakota in August, you're on once every two, maybe three weeks. By the time September rolls around, every so often you're mowing the lawn just to kind of keep down the, little, the areas that grow up. But as there gets to be more and more leaves on the ground, what should you do? Probably what you're gonna do is you're gonna grab your rake and your lawn blower and put them all in the pile. Hopefully you jump in the pile a couple of times and clean it all up again before you finally get it done with it. And make sure you use your compost, compostable bags so that, that when you put it into the lawn waste area, oh, that that's all taken care of. But what we have, we have done in the past couple of years, which is kind of cheap, but it's worked really well, is to use our mulching lawnmower and just run the lawnmower over everything. It mulches up the leaves really finely and just drops them into the ground. And of course, letting nature do its thing over the winter and uh, in the spring. So is that the right thing to do, the wrong thing to do? I don't really know, but I do know it doesn't take hours to do and it hasn't done bad for our lawn over the past couple of years. So get you a mulcher, mulch up them leaves. Winter's coming. You were born in the long summer. You've never known anything else, but now winter is truly coming. When it comes to snow removal, invest in a good snow blower and a few shovels. I like using the sand shovel to scrape off hard snow and ice when it starts melting. And don't forget your bag of ice melter for your sidewalks and driveways. So the next question about the coming winter that I often get asked about is about your vehicles. Do you need a four-wheel drive? Do you have to have snow tires in your area? Generally speaking, not unless you are planning on going off-roading or driving up in you know lead where they get lots of snow uh, quite a bit. If you're just running around the cities, you generally don't need too much on your cars as far as studded tires or chains or anything like that. They get the streets plowed off enough so that you can drive around in a typical all-wheel drive car like I've got behind me. My kids even drive a front-wheel drive car. Generally speaking, they get around okay. Now, that being said, we do have a four-wheel drive and when it's particularly snowy ice outside, that's probably the one I'm gonna jump in. The most important thing you'll wanna take care of on your vehicle is your tires. When you buy that car from the dealership, a lot of times you'll have the, just the smooth summer-type tires on them and those are just gonna spin and not give you any traction. 
go and get a good all season, a little bit aggressive tire and put them on your vehicles. They're good for all year long and they'll do just fine for you in the winter as long as again, you're not you know trying to climb up slopes or anything like that. Your Ford Mustangs and muscle cars, just leave them in the garage for the winter, pull them out through the summer. Also make sure you outfit your car with ice scrapers, a roadside emergency kit that includes emergency blankets, emergency water, and other tools you might need along the road. It's also a great idea to source some gas so you have it if you need it. And I didn't wash my car just for this purpose. You can see what your car looks like after a couple weeks wandering around in the snow. Now the city does a very good job of plowing I-90 and some of the main roads of town. Some of the subdivisions, maybe not so much, but they'll get to it sooner or later. They don't use straight sand or straight salt on the roads. They have a chemical mixture that they put mostly on the crossroads, the stoplights, that kind of thing. So it's certainly not going to rust out your car like it does in Minnesota, but I certainly recommend you get that undercarriage wash on your car every so once in a while. Speaking of the chemical formula they use on the roads, after it dries in your car, it has a tendency to pack out some of your concrete. So if you've got a really nice garage, unlike me, make sure you use an epoxy coating to protect it. He can't protect himself. They'll both be dead come winter. Now let's talk about driving the snow. I grew up in Minnesota. I moved over to Rapid City. I've always been in a snow climate. Of course, I learned to drive in a 1975 Ford LTD. So things are a bit different now. The most important thing to consider when driving in winter conditions, aside from, of course, your tires, like I mentioned, is your speed. I don't care how great your tires are. If you're going 55 miles an hour and expect to stop normally, you're going to coast right on through that intersection and probably hit somebody along the way. Keep your speed low. Be patient. Make sure that there's plenty of time to get where you need to go. When you get to an intersection, start slowing down a long time before and then start pumping your brakes. That'll help you slow down to the point where you can actually get stopped at the intersection. When you get to an intersection and want to make a turn, make sure you're going slow enough and then make the turn without your foot on the brake. When you have your foot cramped on the brake, that's what causes you to skid. Of course, when it's really, really icy, sometimes it doesn't matter what you do. You just kind of slide all around. Go slow, take your time, get to where you need to be. All right, now it's time to talk about clothing for winter. Now, I know all you northerners are like, yeah, yeah, we get this. But for you southerners, let's talk about winter in South Dakota and especially winter in Rapid City. So we have, as you've learned from me talking about before, a vast array of climates. It can start off one day being 60 degrees. And then by the end of that day, by the time you're going home for work, it's 20 degrees. So you want to make sure that you have appropriate clothing with you or in your car or something to make sure that you're prepared for said weird events. And since some days, like today, can be 70 degrees, you don't want to wear sweaters every day of your life either. So layers is the key. Usually I have a t-shirt on underneath and then I will have a long sleeve shirt, of course, on top of that. And then the good old fashioned hoodie sweatshirt. Then that usually keeps me warm for up to, you know, if we're just to 60 degrees or, or 40 degrees. Now on the same token, you're probably going to want to have a bunch of different jackets because you never know. The first one I have here is a just a lightweight jacket keeps the keeps the rain off, keeps the chill off. We I really like these three in one type coats. This one actually has a insert, and I took the insert off. And this is kind of like your not terribly cold but not terribly warm. So we're into 30, 40 degrees. We'll wear this out. We're going walking lately in the mornings. Uh, my wife actually has the insert, so she's wearing the insert, and I'm wearing the outer coat. And it works pretty good for those middle of the road cold days. And of course, you want to make sure that you have a heavy coat, not necessarily a parka. I mean, you don't need to have the whole fuzz around the head kind of thing unless you want to. I mean, that's you know your choice, whatever. But uh, I, I do like these heavy coats. This one actually is a three in one too, but I generally uh, just keep this for my heavier winter coat for when it gets really cold. Uh, I'm not a scarf person, so I like the ones that have the uh, zip up all the way up to here, so I snuggle my nose down in there, right? So make sure you have a variety of coats for whatever the situation is, okay? Now, I also have for uh, pants, I have a, these are basically just a warm up type pants that I wear over the top of my jeans. If it's just a little rainy, or just a little chilly, these work out really good for that. And they would have worked out really good if I remembered to pack them when we went to Ireland last, or uh, two, uh, two years ago. Yeah. 
And of course, if you're going to be outside in the snow a lot, you probably want kind of some kind of snow pants scenario where you are protected for with your skiing or snowboarding or just hanging out in the snow, building snowmen with the kids or whatever. So make sure you've got plenty of different options for your layers so that you can be prepared for no matter what. Now, of course, you also want to keep your hands and head warm. So same thing, lots of different options. I've got a thin pair and then I've got one of these uh, glove type ones with the fingertips come off so you can actually do something, uh, but a, a glove type scenario. Uh, and then I should have, which I can't find right now, but you know, these ski type gloves. This one obviously isn't mine, but it's a good example. Yeah, get one of these, yeah. So that's what I would recommend for your gloves. And of course, in a standard stocking cap is, is great. Hopefully you get one that has a better team than the Vikings at the uh, present moment. Yeah, but we won't talk about that. Typically, as far as footwear is concerned, I'm pretty good running around in my tennis shoes. Obviously, you want to make sure that you get your full leather ones and not the running shoes where the water just soaks right in, uh, like the ones I have right now that are soon to be returned. Uh, other than that, I have uh, these boots here. Uh, these keep me pretty warm. and They've also got this rubber outer sole here to keep the water out. And then, of course, you want to make sure you have some kind of uh, bigger, heavier a uh, wool type sock uh, as well. Make sure your boots are a little bit bigger so you can put a couple pairs of socks on underneath. And there are other things such as uh, toe warmers and glove warmers that you can just throw on your boot. Those things work amazing when it's when you have to be outside for a long time and it's really, really cold. Yeah, try those, that really helps. Now, I know there's plenty of other places that have some really, really good winter wear that if you're gonna be outside in the winter, in the cold a long time, you wanna make sure that you get those. So for example, if you're gonna be working outside in the in the cold, you wanna make sure you get the, the Carhartt brand coveralls and, and jacket. Those things work really well. And if you're skiing, make sure you get the actual skiing and winter wear that, uh, you know, like Columbia and Eddie Bauer and RER and some of these other peoples, they have really great winter clothing. Because the saying always is, it's not so much the cold, it's a matter of just not wearing appropriate clothing. Because when winter really comes in and it really gets uh, hits home and you're stuck at home or you feel like you're stuck at home all the time, it's important to get out and enjoy the winter. Put on your coat, put on your, your hats, get your boots on, go take some winter walks, go skiing, do something out in the outside, even just going for a walk so you don't get that crazy cabin feel, right? So be prepared, make sure you get the right clothing for what fits for you and your style of living. The other question I get asked a lot is, well, what about when your power goes out? What happens then? So I've lived in Rapid City since 1990, and there was never a time when the power went out for a long enough period of time that made me actually think about survival and food and warmth. Until Atlas. Atlas was a snowstorm that came by October 3rd, I think, 2013. And we were without power for about a day and a half. I think it might have been, might have been two days which really wasn't bad compared to some of the other properties out miles out from town where the power lines were above ground, all of those power lines broke. And so they were out without power for a week. So after that point, we got to thinking, well, what should we do? Because what we ended up doing was bringing the propane grill inside and using that for a little bit of heat, uh, that, that kind of thing. So we live in an all electric house. We do not have a fireplace. And so it was a matter of, okay, what can we do if we need to, if we have to provide some warmth, if we're out without power for a while, what do we, what do we get? So here's kind of what we put together. And this is just a few items to, for you to get to thinking about what you might want to provide to make sure that you have in your house as well. So we did get these propane bottle, propane heaters. Now, yes, I know the label says, make sure you don't use these in the inside and have airflow, et cetera. I understand that, but at the time, we're just we're looking about a little bit of warmth. You know, we can crack open a window, but these things should provide some warmth for all in one room if we need it. And we've got three or four of these laying around. And of course, then we also got a Coleman camping stove so that we can actually cook if we needed to. And of course, if you have these things, then you need to make sure you have plenty of power of bottles, for fulfilling food bottles on hand to power said things, to include, of course, matches. And these little things are some fire starter pucks. I'm not sure if we'd ever actually use these in our scenario, but they came with the package, I think, that we bought. And of course, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you have candles, flashlights, and different kinds of flashlights. This is a head flashlight. And of course, the batteries to power said flashlights. And you also make sure that you have a way to power your phones. So get some of these emergency power 
for things for your phones as well. Obviously, first aid kit, obviously should have some of that. And then you got to thinking about, okay, food. So we've been stocking up on some food. Go to Sam's Club, get your case of vegetables, get some cases of, of meat and that kind of thing. Make sure you have some kind of food in the house so that if you're there for a couple of days, you've got something to eat. And of course, with that eating, make sure you have something to drink. So we've got a couple gallons of water downstairs. We also have four or five gallon water containers uh, that we have also that will store some water if we need to. And then finally, if you want and go and buy a emergency supply kit so that you can feed your people. If you do, these are kind of like your meals ready to eat scenario. You do have to use water, so make sure, again, you need more water to use these uh, as well. Now, this isn't going to, this is a 30 day kit for one person. We figured a couple days for us, four to six people, we should be able to get by. That's really all we were looking to do is what's it gonna take to get by a couple of days if we need to. Now, I mean, if there's a you know nationwide EMP blast that knocks out the systems, this isn't, you know, we're all gonna be dead anyway. So this isn't really concerning that. It's just a matter of how can we get by in a couple of days if we need to, if the power does go out in Atlas like it did a couple of years ago. The other question I get last along this note is how come there aren't that many fireplaces up, up there? I think I've seen more fireplaces in Texas homes than I have up here. It's really quite bizarre. But I think a lot of it had to do with the style of building and the affordability of the building, that kind of thing. And so of course, back in the day, when we started talking about energy efficiency and the way the fireplaces were built, originally weren't very weren't very efficient. Uh, so they got replaced with gas fireplaces, which are great, but again, they're fired by electricity as well. Now, if you wanted to add a fireplace to your property, there are some different wood burning stove options that should work for you, even ones that have, and that pipe out beside, uh, outside the side of the house, of the side of a wall, instead of going all the way through the roof. There are a couple of fireplace installation centers in town that can help you do the whole thing and help you get set up if you need that fireplace security for you and your family. I certainly love the ambience of a fireplace. I love the wood heat, but I really don't want to go around and find and cut wood all the time. Well, I hope I've answered your questions for you about preparing for winter. Keep watching my channel for more videos about Rapid City. And now, there's not gonna be many days like this, so I'm out of here. Love where you live.